What's up guys? It's Friday and I feel like something happens on Friday. And today's guest we have back, actually I don't know if we've ever done this guy. He made our top five uh, worst a few years ago, our top five worst list. Uh, but I don't know if I've ever done What the Fitness on him. So uh, this one didn't get sent to us by anybody. This was one, this is, this is all me. I guess I'm being selfish and I'm not taking your request this week. This is uh, Dr. Eric Berg. So Dr. Berg is a chiropractor who makes nutrition videos. Be kind of like me making videos about space exploration. But hey, fuck me, right? His new video is called How to Grow Your Muscles. Now, I, I hate people who make, you know, these kinds of arguments, but I just don't know if Dr. Berg has ever lifted a weight in his life based on his physique, but I could be wrong. Maybe he, maybe he likes the pink dumbbells at the gym. Let's see what he has to say about how to grow your muscles. And if you guys remember, we actually, I actually did a prelude to this video earlier this week with my... Uh, educational video on why growth hormone is not anabolic. So if you like that one, you're gonna love this. Here's a good question. Can you actually grow your muscles when you're doing intermittent fasting and keto? Now I have done other videos on this, but I'm gonna go more into the exercise part of this because if you're doing intermittent fasting and keto and you're not doing exercise, you're not gonna grow your muscles, okay? Why? Because the most important stimulus to Muscle hypertrophy, which is growing muscle, is the intensity of the exercise. The intensity of the exercise. Ironically, now, showing somebody, exercise part, uh, I wanted to, ironically, showing somebody jogging on a treadmill while he talks about this. Talk about the foundation that surrounds this. Because when you do intermittent fasting consistently and you're actually adapted to ketosis, you will have higher levels of human growth hormone. And human growth hormone does cause the growth of muscle. And it also... All right, so we're going to stop right there. So first two things that are incorrect. He is correct that you need to lift weights if you want to grow muscle. That is the only thing that he said so far that is accurate. Uh, he said the most important stimulus is uh, intensity. That's actually not true. And when, when we say intensity, it's... It's, there actually is a definition of it when it comes to resistance training. That is a percentage of your one rep max. Most people think about intensity as how hard do I feel like I'm working? That's actually called intensiveness. Intensity is how much weight you're putting on the bar. We have shown repeatedly that volume load is the most important stimulus for muscular growth. And there's several meta-analyses and systematic reviews to show this. Now that's not saying that intensity isn't important. You probably do need a certain amount of load, like over 40% of a one rep max. If you're under 40% of a one rep max, uh, even if you do high reps to failure, you're not gonna grow uh, requisite muscle. Over that, it appears that just training close enough to failure or fatigue is sufficient to grow muscle so long as volume is adequate. So volume is quite simply reps times sets times weight. Now there's always people who straw man this and they are false dichotomy this and they go, well, you can't just grow muscle put doing the bar for a thousand reps. No, you, you can't. You can't. You're right. Um, there does need to be, you need to approach failure with it. And if you're using such a light weight that you're not approaching failure, um, you're probably not going to grow as much muscle. So both intensity and volume are important, but volume, is, volume load is significantly more important than intensity. He said growth hormone is anabolic to... Uh, or causes muscle, muscle hypertrophy. That is categorically untrue. Um, as I talked about in the video on Wednesday, and you guys can check the references in the description, as well as click the other video, check it out. Growth hormone is anabolic to connective tissue and increasing total body water. There's no research showing that it increases cross-sectional area, even when they inject it. And if we're talking about the amount of growth hormone you're getting from just fasting, not even close. But I would recommend going checking out our other video where we talk about that in depth. Prevents the loss of muscle. 
Now, on the opposite spectrum, if you're eating frequently through the day and you have insulin resistance and you have blood sugar issues or you're pre-diabetic or diabetic, you're going to have less amino acids going into that muscle. You're going to have more atrophy. So this is an important... So that's actually not supported by research data. Uh, people who are overweight or obese or pre-diabetic on average actually have more lean body mass um, because they have more total mass. So yes, they have more fat mass, but they also have more lean body mass. Yes, uh, you also, you will have higher levels of, of blood levels of amino acids if you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, but that's, that's such a huge leap to say that's because they're not getting delivered to muscle. That's, that's not accurate. Um, and it's, it's just him trying to make little mechanistic data fit his theory. So that's actually completely untrue. An important principle to consume two meals a day, uh, maybe even one meal a day, but I think two meals a day would be perfect. Maybe keep your... Also not supported by data. We now have uh, several studies showing that you cannot, you do not have a storage mechanism for protein. My PhD research demonstrated this as well and was supported by research from Stu Phillips' lab that optimizing the muscle hypertrophy response probably requires three to five high quality, high protein meals. You're not gonna maximize it in one or two meals because the maximum anabolic cap at a meal for protein is probably around 40 to 50 grams, depending on your own body weight and the quality of the protein source you're consuming. And after that, you're not really getting any more anabolic effect. So if you're trying to get in 200 grams of protein a day and you're doing it over two meals, well, you're having 100 grams of protein at each meal, 50 grams of that protein at each meal is not contributing anything towards muscle building, whereas if you had four meals of 50 grams of protein a day, you'd be getting a more potent response. And again, we even have a study now on intermittent fasting showing that the group that did intermittent fasting lost twice as much lean body mass as the group that didn't. Your carbs at the higher end, but not over that, about 50 grams per day, because it is true that carbohydrates do stimulate insulin and insulin is an anabolic hormone. However, we don't wanna to go too high because we were trying to prevent insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So if we provide the, the uh, top limit of carbs, I think that would be a smart thing to do. And of course, we wanna make Citation. sure that we have enough complete protein for the muscles to choose from, but not go too much. So seven to eight ounces of protein per meal would be a really good option. What you have to realize is that when you consume protein, whether it's meat, fish, or eggs, or whatever, minimally, at least half of that is wasted as glucose fuel, because it tr protein turns into glucose, or as uh, nitrogen waste. So you're not really a... This guy has no idea what he's talking about. First off, when you use a nebulous term, if it can mean anything, it means nothing. So when he says protein is wasted, what exactly does he mean by that? If you're talking about nitrogen not being retained in muscles, well, if that's the case, anything over about 50 or 60 grams of protein is wasted. That's all you need to achieve nitrogen balance. What he doesn't realize is the same amount of protein required to maximize muscle protein synthesis also causes increased oxidation of protein, meaning it will be converted via gluconeogenesis to glucose. He's so worried about it getting converted to glucose, he's recommending you not maximize anabolism. And he's talking about it being wasted. Just because an amino acid gets converted to glucose or oxidized, doesn't mean it doesn't help initiate anabolic signaling before that happens. This is an example of someone who has read just enough to be dangerous without actually knowing what they're talking about when it comes to protein metabolism. And this is literally my wheelhouse. My PhD was quite literally, taking that from Dr. Cho, quite literally on muscle protein synthesis. Not really absorbing 100% of that unless you're taking certain types of amino acid uh, blend. Also not true, you can absorb all the protein you eat. The idea that there's this cap on absorption is not true. The cap is how much of it gets used for anabolism. Blends. So by adding a ton of protein with your meals, that will not help you with this. It just creates more stress on your kidney and your liver, and it can actually increase your glucose a little bit too much. 
Also not true. There is zero evidence that high protein diets damage a healthy kidney. This is patently false and has been shown so multiple times, including a recent systematic review. Sorry, Dr. Berg, might help you to actually read some research data that comes from after the 1980s. And of course, sufficient sleep is very, very important because if you're not sleeping, you increase the stress and the hormone cortisol breaks down muscle protein. Now, this data that I'm going to tell you about right now uh, is very, very powerful. And uh, I got this from an interview from Dorian Yates. So, so, he so he got data from an interview. You keep using this word data. I don't think it means what you think it means. He actually achieved Mr. Olympia six times. So I wanted to see what he had to say about muscle growth. And I really liked his data. Now, it is true that Not data. most bodybuilders, including him, took a lot of steroids in growth hormones. Steroids? However, I really um, liked his philosophy on muscle growth, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, personally, I am not doing it simply because that's not my goal right now, but I think um, it's worth looking at. This is what he said. Now, he'll start like off with some warm-up sets, okay, some lightweight, just like most people will do that. So you warm up the muscle with some lighter weights, but then he will do one insanely, extremely difficult set of about six to eight reps. So he will do these reps to total failure and beyond, okay? So he will go as hard as he can, and then we can't go anymore. He'll get someone to spot him and assist him with a few more reps, okay? So he's going beyond total failure. And uh, that's based on this principle of intensity right here. I mean, he is maximizing that uh, workout intensity. Because really what you're trying to do is you're trying to damage the muscle. You're trying to destroy that muscle through difficulty. Now, a couple key points to this. You want to keep perfect form, okay? And you don't want to recruit other... All right, so that's as far as I can go without addressing some of the bullshit in there. So... He's using anecdote, right? So Dorian Yates, what, you know, take muscle to complete failure. You don't need to do a bunch of volume, just one set per muscle group, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yes, Dorian built a great physique doing that, 100%. But if his anecdote is valuable, is his anecdote more valuable than Ronnie Coleman and Lee Haney, who won eight Mr. Olympias, two more than Dorian Yates, and they used a ton of volume and worked each muscle multiple times per week. So the, see, this is the problem with anecdote, is you don't get to pick and choose whose anecdote has value. And again, if we're going by anecdote, Lee Haney and Ronnie Coleman and Phil Heath, who also won eight Mr. Olympias, I'm pretty sure, uh, all trained with quite a bit of volume, multiple sessions per week per body part. They won eight Mr. Olympias. Their, uh, their anecdote's not more valuable. The research data says volume load is the most important thing. Intensity does matter, but not as much and his comment that you need to damage the muscle. That appears to not be true either. We have multiple studies now that show that you can build muscle without damaging it, or if you remove the damage stimulus, it doesn't impair the hypertrophy response. Damage does not appear to be a requisite for growth. And you don't want to create momentum as you're working out. You're trying to isolate one muscle at a time to maximum failure and beyond. But there's something else that he said that is really, really cool. When you uh, work a muscle, you're gonna, let's say you're doing bench press, you're gonna contract the pec, okay? So you're, you're coming out like this, and then you're gonna come back, right? So you have concentric movement, which is contraction. Then you have eccentric movement, which is lengthening. So if I'm coming down in a bench press, my pecs are lengthening. And the eccentric part, which is the negative part, is actually stronger than the concentric part, but it's often neglected. So what he does, with help, he will also then focus on the negative part and bring that to failure. So if you were to have someone spot you in a bench press and you've just did eight reps to total failure, you would have them assist you on the concentric part, okay, help you lift it all the way up, and then you would just bring it down slowly, okay? And you would keep doing that until you can't do it anymore to failure. 
that way you completely and utterly exhaust that muscle uh, to the point where you create some serious damage. Now he's so ironically, there was a study that was done investigating slow negatives versus fast negatives and found that fast negatives actually caused more muscle damage than slow negatives. Now I'm not saying fast negatives are better, but if damage is so important, like Eric Berg says, then why is he recommending slow negatives and not fast negatives, which actually cause more damage? Again, this is when somebody hasn't read the literature, obviously when they're referring to an interview as data, and is literally, he's making this shit up as he goes. Now he's only gonna work that muscle once a week. He's not gonna hit it tomorrow or the next day. So he works at one muscle per week, and here's the key. You let it recover fully, 100%. Here's the big mistake that a lot of people do is they work out when that muscle is incomplete that hasn't healed. So that's when you create scar tissue and injury. <laughs> so this, number five, allowing your muscle to recover fully is what makes the muscle get bigger, okay? The exercise, the intensity is just the damage of the muscle and then you let it heal. And so then the next time you work out, you're a little bit stronger. And at some point you want to keep increasing the weight more and more and more until the muscle grows. So you don't want to go for momentum. You want controlled, isolated movement with a pause. So if you're doing a bench press, you come all the way to the end, you pause and then come all the way back. And you come back on the eccentric part slower than this part right here. So we have some warmups, one intense. So the anabolic response to resistance exercise, the muscle protein synthesis response, is at best 96 hours. Um, and I believe that's in beginners. There's quite a bit of data showing that in advanced trainees, it might be 24 to 48 hours. What you're doing, Dr. Berg, is you're mistaking soreness for anabolism. If you want to be sore, go run a marathon. You'll be sore. I promise you, you didn't grow muscle. Also, if you only train a muscle once per week, you're not taking advantage of the repeated bout effect. So when you first start training, yes, you're sore for a very long period of time. And if you start training more frequently, what will happen is you will still be sore for a long period of time, but after a few weeks, you will get less and less sore to the point where if you're training each muscle two to three times a week, you probably won't get that sore. Uh, in fact, I don't really get that much soreness anymore at all, even when I train to failure. And so that's because I have trained the repeated bout effect where the muscle protects itself from becoming so sore. Soreness is not required for growth and it's not an indicator of growth. And in fact, it can impair growth, like in this case, where it inhibits you from training for a full week since the anabolic response is only about 24 to 96 hours long. So at best it's four days. So working every muscle group once a week, you're leaving anywhere from three to six days on the table where that muscle is not being stimulated for growth. Set per exercise. Now he may hit that muscle like the pec with maybe three to four to five different exercises, but he's only gonna do that one intense to total failure and beyond uh, once per week. And for details and all this, definitely get one of his books and you can read up on it. Um, he works out one hour per day, only four times a week. On the off days, he did cardio, which actually helps the recovery. Now, of course, if you're gonna do this, you do not wanna jump into this right away because you could hurt yourself. You wanna go into this very, very gradual, probably hire a personal trainer to help you, and you want to, uh, over a period of weeks, build up to this intense total failure and beyond uh, set. But I really think if you combine this with your keto, intermittent fasting, keep your stress low, good sleep, you're gonna... So one more comment on the uh, keto slash intermittent fasting. There was a study done uh, a few years ago that compared uh, a protein calorie equated ketogenic diet versus a non-ketogenic diet that was more balanced and looked at hypertrophy. And what they showed was the group that did resistance training and keto gained significantly less lean body mass than the group that was non-ketogenic. 
That is likely because insulin is, although he said it's anabolic, I would argue it's not anabolic in adults. Um, insulin has more of a permissive effect on muscle protein synthesis, but it is a pretty powerful anti-proteolytic hormone, meaning it inhibits protein degradation, which is the other side of the protein uh, balance equation, meaning if you want to grow muscle, you can either increase protein synthesis, decrease protein degradation, or do both. So insulin is a pretty powerful inhibitor of protein degradation. So again, when you actually put this stuff to the test, when you test it in people, not spouting off about hormone levels and amino acid delivery to muscle and like all these little mechanistic things that he doesn't even know what he's talking about. Intermittent fasting had more muscle loss than people who didn't do intermittent fasting. The data on pr muscle protein synthesis shows that you don't optimize it and you don't optimize lean body mass unless you have multiple protein, high quality protein feedings per day. When you compare ketogenic to non-ketogenic and people who resistance train, people who do ketogenic, gained less lean body mass. That is what we care about. Not these silly, convoluted, mental gymnastic mechanisms. You're gonna be able to get muscle hypertrophy. All right, and number five, very important. Okay, this is gonna get you this right here. So you have to work out intensely to create the damage and the soreness, and then you have to recover Again, soreness completely is not a requisite for, for you to be able to have this occur. So it might take longer than a week it could take two weeks and sometimes maybe even three if you're just starting out. Thanks for watching. So in short, that video had more bullshit packed into it than I, I think maybe any video I've ever seen. He does not understand protein metabolism. He does not understand resistance training. He does not understand the mechanisms of hypertrophy. And he looks like he's never lifted a weight in his life. So I'm not sure what the appeal about this guy's information on muscle building nutrition is. I wish I could unsee what I've just seen because it's a total farce. And Dr. Berg, anytime you would like to debate any of these topics, I'll be here. So guys, if you'd like to see a debate between me and Dr. Berg, go leave him a comment on his YouTube or his Instagram. Please don't be nasty. Just say you'd love to see a friendly debate because I don't think this guy has a clue what he's talking about. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Click the like and subscribe button. If you hate the video, go buy some of my stuff because I hate it when you buy my stuff. Much love guys. Have a great week.